march at 12 o'clock, join the student march at 12 o'clock today against the increase in overseas student fees. If there are any students there in the Humanities Building or the Arts Building, and I don't think there are, but if there are any students in the Humanities Building, will they please come out? The voice of a new student militancy. A call for strike action against a government decision to increase fees for overseas students. The strike was the biggest in British academic history. An explosion of frustration inside Britain's student movement. An omen of a new form of student protest. The morning of a day of protest, 11.30 at Manchester University. Ahead of 3,000 students, a two-mile shuttle to the city centre for a four-hour teach-in to argue the injustice of a government decision to treble the cost of higher education for 16,000 overseas students in this country. Posters, would you like posters? Today, it costs those overseas students £70 a year towards their education. The remaining £550 is paid by the British taxpayer. One at the back, the other two big banners. Well, anybody who wants to, has got nothing to hide. The Minister of Education, Mr Anthony Crossland, believes the present subsidy is too much of a burden for Britain to bear. In future, overseas students will have to pay £250 a year. The plan has enraged students and teachers alike. Protest marches were organised last week in most big cities as students staged a one-day walkout, some with the blessing of university staff. No one welcomed this chance of a showdown more than the hardcore militants of the National Union of Students. I don't think the public's got any objection to uh, a trade union or to any pressure group putting its case forcefully in the way that we are. The reason why we're protesting about student fees is because it means that a lot of our fellow students are going to have to leave this country and go back to their own countries where they won't be able to continue their education. But also because students are realising that it's time they stood up and told the government clearly what their attitudes were. I think there's a feeling here of sort of student unionism, that students um, realise that there's basically not all that much difference between them working in a university and somebody else working in a factory. We still want to have a say in our pay and conditions. We still want to have a say in how we're administered. And at the moment, with the fees increase, this is a typical case of a total lack of democracy in the decision-making process. Everybody feels that nobody was consulted on fees. Twelve o'clock, the West End of London. 4,000 students begin a damp procession towards the Ministry of Education. Six student leaders are to deliver a petition to the Minister. Delegations have assembled from colleges and technical schools all over London. The protest has the reluctant blessing of the National Union of Students. But the real activists are a ginger group within this union, the Radical Students' Alliance. To them, the march is only the first move in a campaign to have a say in the education they're getting and the kind of society they live in. The particular importance of the overseas one is it's an urgent issue. Now we feel we can do something about, and that's why we're out in the rain. But the over the long term, I think British students are going to get much more active. There'll be much more of them on the street, and they won't just be asking to sell you rag, rag day books and things like that. They'll be asking you to take seriously what they've got to say about politics and about the education they're getting. I think the British students have woken up after a long time. Ironically, the great leap forward in higher education is the cause of the present student outcry. Essex is one of the 17 new universities that have been built in Britain since the war. The numbers of British university students has doubled in the past 10 years. Today, there are nearly half a million. In 10 years, the number will have doubled again. As the demand for university places increases, it creates discontent that can only be relieved by more expansion currently held in check by the government's spending policy. Essex, as an example, was planned to provide 6,000 places. It's presently got room for 700, and there are no vacancies until the brakes on building are taken off. Those lucky enough to get a place are caught up in an educational rat race designed to satisfy an appetite for more and more highly trained people. The students themselves charge scathingly that the present cramming system is turning universities into battery farms for broiler technicians. Without the chance of a say in how their lives are run, they feel helpless and frustrated. We want our voice to be heard. We want to have an urgent voice. 
Our voice is getting damn hoarse with giving good advice. At the moment, young people have no power in, in, in ideological terms, in terms of the media, the newspapers. They're infatuated by youth. They want to know what colour skirts or dresses or what sort of drugs young people are taking the whole time. They're infatuated by youth. But in, in, the, in the real society of power and organisation, young people have no power. Quite the reverse. They're, they're, they're very much organised by other people's behalf. They, they're in other people's grown-up kind of situation. And the point is that with, there's going to be changes in the next 10 years. The vote at 18, increasing young people's militancy. Students, I hope, over the next five years, becoming a, a really major force in British society. The sort of thing that's taken seriously, the sort of thing that's challenged. The sort of thing that MPs are asking for students' loyalties. They're coming to appeal to us, and we'll damn sure make that they give us some decent programmes. Elsewhere, students have been making their voice heard for years. Japanese students have brought down governments. In Indonesia, in India, in Egypt, they've been major instruments of political power. This tradition of student protests has only lately spread to the West. In the United States, the students challenged a generation of political conformity by opposing the suppression of Negroes and President Johnson's policies in Vietnam. The average British student has never been such a political animal. Have you heard anything more about your pension, Kay? Uh, no, it's just the same. Yeah. <laughs> Struggle along with it somehow, yes. you know. They're not giving you any more? No, mm. no. Unless if you'd like some. Well, would you like one? Yes, we may as well have. Okay. Um, anyway. British students normally make headlines only with the absurdities of rag day stunts. <laughs> their social work of visiting the elderly and their contributions to charity are often underestimated. Yeah. Thank you, darling. Thank you very much. Mm. Oh, I think I'll have a little more milk in mine. What about you? Yes, no? well, thank you. Thank you, dear. No. Mm. Have you heard from Natalie, from your sister? I've heard from Mary, my sister Mary in yes. California. She mm. and her husband. I had a lovely letter from them. She Good. worries over me a lot, you know. Mm. Have you thought any more about going out to California? Well, I have, you know, but um, I think they want younger people out there. Um, well, we support a specific project, project our group. Uh, our profits go to, uh, to support, help support a small clinic in Tripoli. There they, there's a doctor and Mrs McCarthy and a part-time nurse who um, help the local um, people in a very poor area. They have a high proportion of eye disease there, trachoma, and they spend a lot of money each month simply on teramycin eye ointment to um, help prevent this disease. A self-sacrifice like eating a two and six minute lunch of bread and cheese can save the sight of hundreds of children in Libya. The support for charity organizations like Oxfam and War on Want comes primarily from British students. Fundraising for charity has been a long tradition of British students, but it's only in the last three years that they've seriously taken up social work. The arrival of immigrants from India and Pakistan has given them new opportunities. He is a fisherman. Good. Now, can you read this for me? Looking at the picture. Here are Jack and Bill. Read this with their cat. Tiger, tiger is a striped, striped, striped cat who was white, who has, who has. Today, white. student activity in Britain is beginning to follow the international pattern. The British student is on the move. The protest against the increase in overseas students' fees has given them the chance to raise their voice, a voice that won't easily be silenced. There are fears of increasing government interference in student life, interference against which there seems to be no appeal. Most British students belong to the National Union of Students, a movement set up to protect their interests. But many feel the union is tied down by its own constitution. Discussion on matters not related to student welfare is banned. The activists who form the Radical Students' Alliance are in revolt against that constitution. Come 
Their ginger group was set up three months ago to push for collective student action, to control their own unions, have a say in academic and disciplinary matters, and work for a classless, integrated and comprehensive educational system. The Radical Students' Alliance doesn't want to limit student influence to educational policy only, though. As leaders of the new meritocracy, they want to be taken seriously and be consulted on matters of national and international policy. They do not believe it's possible to divorce themselves from political affairs, nor do they want to. This is the nub of their quarrel with the NUS, whom they accuse of a lack of militancy. The Radicals' platform is for responsible political action rather than persuasion behind closed doors. One of the founders and leading agitators inside the Radical Students' Alliance is David Widgery, a 21-year-old medical student at University College London. Widgery covers a thousand miles a week, hitchhiking to universities and training colleges, lobbying for support. His campaign to stir up interest in the students' place in society has a big following among every student group in Britain. We want to help them. We want to get outside this great, cosy monument, get off the, the soft, cosy, fiberglass chairs we sit in, get out of this incredible sort of well-bred, conceited little society of our own and go into a real world, in real abrasive problems and talk about things. And you've got two sorts of university. You've got the sort of university where you, you sit quietly in Parkland and you drink sherry and, and you read nice books and you get a good accent and a better job and so on and so forth. All very simple, all very insulated from real situations. Or you've got the other sort of university which puts you on an assembly line for three years and bolts onto you certain sorts of technological skills and then lap, puts you in an office or a factory to give other people orders the whole of the time. This is not the sort of university that I think we ought to be about. This is precisely the sort of student that ought to be in the university is one who's going out and challenging conventional morality, is acting as, as, the, as, the, as the mind and the intellect of, of the whole society, acting as the antenna in society. The point is that if the government wants to have conscious, uh, conscious citizens when they leave university, they must, they must expect dissent. They mustn't expect us just to be here so that we can gain some sort of academic qualification. We're here to, uh, to increase our consciousness about the whole of society. The thing we want to challenge, and, and the thing I think which has remained unchallenged for so long, is the government's priorities. Well, I just totally disagree with them, for example. They spend vast amounts of money on defence and try and save a paltry sum on um, um, overseas students' tuition fees. We just, we just disagree with this. For one Polaris, we could be building numerous new primary schools, and heavens knows this is needed badly enough in our society. I think this, for the first time, is being challenged, and I think it's right that it should be challenged and that this should continue. This becomes a very urgent matter. Um, you know, all channels of protest are being absolutely closed down. Um, the political parties are becoming so much alike. What's the difference now between the Conservative Party and the Labour Party? And the NUS is just becoming another one of these bureaucratic machines. Centralised bureaucracy that is acting on behalf, which is to whom we are delegating our responsibility to think politically, is, is disappeared. And our, you know, their type of politics is the politics of press releases, the type of the, the, the intimate me meeting with the minister, the kind of, you will look after it, we'll wear the suits, we'll, we'll talk nicely, we'll put a good case. I'm all for putting good cases. But the fact is we can put a good case here and now, and we can have a mass lobby which is responsible, and we, we can have a mass meeting, and we can, we can talk in mass sort of terms. And their sort of policy is this kind of King Canute business, you know, they're, they're, they're great as long as they can get reductions on tennis rackets, they can, you know, do you oversee, <laughs> they, they can do overseas flights to sort of Marseille there and back. They're, they're, they're great on this sort of thing. But as regards political realities, political change, they, they, they've got a about as much chance as the Royal Society of Prevention of Cruelty to Animals or something, you know. They really are, are, are monumentally relevant to this regard of political action. And, and the way why they are is because they've always suppressed people like us. They've, they've gone around and systematically tried to stamp out the grassroots. They've always talked about grassroots. They've been using selective weed killer on us for a long time. The NUS is an unrepresentative, monolithic body. It's like a huge trade union that's forgotten what its members think. It doesn't consult a large number of people within it about the issues that they're concerned with. The radical students in this country are not opposed to the NUS being there. We are in no way attempting to set up an alternative organisation to the NUS because our slogan with regard to the NUS, to all the student unions, to all the progressive students in this country is stay in and fight. Stay in and fight their bureaucracy, stay in and fight their attitude of, of, of being wishy-washy with a government that seems to be attacking every student interest at the moment, stay in and fight the attitude of an executive which seems to believe that it has some sort of function to, to 
bring about student respectability rather than to make itself the, the vehicle for student representation. Trevor Fisk is full-time secretary of the National Union of Students. We welcome any constructive comment on the problems that the NUS faces and any help with trying to achieve our objectives. But we can't allow 22,000 students and the collective membership of the three student political organizations concerned is only 22,000 to dominate the membership of 366,000 which the NUS currently holds. Now, if we're going to meet the objectives that we're elected to, uh, to uh, fulfill, we have to obviously negotiate with a wide range of people at a national level. We had a march, not just because we were protesting against the increase in overseas student fees, but because we were worried stiff about the way in which that decision was taken. We were concerned at the powerlessness of, of the individual student, just as we're concerned at the powerlessness of the individual in this country to have, any dif to have any influence on major decisions that are being taken that affect him personally. We were concerned because the decision on increasing overseas student fees was taken simply in the cabinet. When we held our lobby against the increase in fees, we found that the great majority of MPs opposed the decision. There are so, so many people, even among students now, who think that if, if a decision is taken by the government, it's no good standing up and saying, we students refuse to accept this decision. They'll say, you know, you must be respectable, you must be nice, you must work through the democratic processes. But the, it's quite clear that the democratic processes aren't working. There's no consultation. The National Union of Students was never even told that the fees were going to be increased. The truth of the matter is that nobody was consulted. The vice chancellors weren't consulted. The overseas governments concerned weren't consulted. And I think the Secretary of State was severely censored for this when the matter was debated in Parliament. On the majority of issues which do concern our membership, we have now very good working relationships with the government departments concerned. Terry Lacey is 21. He's a postgraduate student at Manchester University and also a leader of the Radical Students' Alliance. The National Union of Students has condemned the alliance as communist-dominated, but Lacey is officially a young liberal. In fact, like most of his colleagues, he's tied by no party political line. There seems to be an assumption by university authorities that they have some sort of right to tell us what to do, to make us behave as if we were children, to, to, to enforce regulations which are really totally unnecessary, and to in fact encourage the very things they don't want to by being so restrictive in their attitude. You have cases of colleges where there is a regulation where if a boy comes to visit his girlfriend, the bed has to be moved out of the room. In our colleges, we have regulations that are remnants from a Victorian society, and the National Union of Students will or can do nothing about those regulations. But local groups of students who get together and decide that they will change them or collectively disobey them, then you will see changes in the regulations. I don't think that force will ever solve these problems because force will alienate the people who ultimately must give you the concessions. And I don't believe within a university, for instance, you can ever wrest your objectives out of the hands of a vice chancellor by violence outside his study door. You can only do it by convincing him of the logic of your case. A great many students who are active supporters of the Labour Party during the last general election, these were the people who helped to get the Labour Party in. All the socialist societies and the Labour clubs up and down the country worked very hard to get a Labour government, and now they're all thoroughly disillusioned. And, and one can obviously see that these energies uh, 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 that these people have, they, well, they want to channel them into, into some uh, uh, sort of political direction in which they think they're going to get some of the things that they were asking for then. At one o'clock in London, the march had reached the Ministry of Education. The leaders tried to petition Mr. Crossland. He wasn't there, but civil servants listened patiently to the demonstrators without making any comment. The latest news is that the minister remains firm. He will not back down. Out, out! Out, out! Crossland! Out, out! Unlike many student demonstrations, this march was significant because it dealt with education, a subject of wide interest and concern. The National Union of Students and the Ginger Group Radicals may disagree on tactics, but their aims are the same. They're united in the fight against crowded classrooms and a shortage of facilities that suggest to them a policy of trying to pour quarts into pint pots. 
and they want equality for college students who they claim are currently treated as second-class citizens in the academic world. Their demands may seem inconsistent and politically naive. It would be unwise to ignore their mood of unrest. And people have very little perception of what it's really like to be a student, you know, the reality of the student situation. We've, 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 I think for too long students have been seen publicly and probably actually have had their heads in a, a series of clouds, you know, Radio London land or LSD land or just boredom land, uh, inventing sort of paraphernalia of their own lives and so on. Uh, and quite honestly, that's where authority wants their heads, it seemed to me. They want them up in the clouds and when they get them out of the clouds and start, you know, creating trouble, if you like, doing things on a, ma on a large scale, asking awkward questions, and people start saying they're irresponsible, but then anything that was ever any good has been called irresponsible. The, the students of this country feel frustrated politically in that they do act responsibly in the majority of cases and do feel that the students' community collectively should have a greater power than it does. When they come into their individual college, however, they find that often they themselves, as 18-year-olds, are treated by their college authorities in a way that an 18-year-old outside of college would not be treated. And so there's a sense of frustration with the college authorities. Start off with the fundamental precept that a lot of people in the emerging student movement have, which is that they think that our democracy in its present state is a bit of a sham. Uh, it's got very bureaucratized, that decisions are made by a few people and the people far removed from uh, the ability of others to change their decisions. And so we, we believe in a, a far more fundamental sort of participating democracy generally in our society. And if you translate that into the terms of the university campus and also the local community, it means students getting involved far more in the administration of their colleges and their universities, having a lot more representation on all sorts of committees in universities, particularly disciplinary committees, uh, I would hope, you know, in running syllabuses and things like this. All sorts of consultations could take place that don't now, and all sorts of petty regulations could, could, could in fact be got rid of. There must be a change in society's attitude towards students, the student movement, and indeed youth collectively, is now maturing far more quickly and wants power far more quickly, some effective form of power. Over the last five years, while I've been involved in the student movement, I have seen a vast improvement in the attitude of authorities in colleges and in the public at large towards youth and towards students. And I think this trend must continue. One of the basic jobs of NUS is to promote it. 2.30, Westminster the end of the line for a protest march. A few of the marchers are allowed inside to lobby their elders. The following day, the Commons voted on the opposition motion of censure on the proposal to increase overseas students' fees. The motion was defeated by 276 to 222, 40 Labour MPs abstaining. Oddly enough, the sort of political dissatisfaction being expressed by students is a backhanded compliment to the present government. Their policy of giving a top priority to expanding higher education has opened university doors wider to a generation that has destroyed the punt and gown image of the traditional British student. Among today's students, there's an increasing number of lower and middle class people without a tradition of submission to academic discipline and with energies that can't easily be satisfied with study and conventional university activities. Society's current interest in youth and talk of a vote at 18 has given them a new feeling of power. These students do feel strongly about major issues and want the same right as transport workers, miners or engineers to express those feelings. There's, there's some sort of block in a lot of people's minds. They seem to think that because we're students, because we're here studying, because we're doing uh, a sort of work, a sort of job that, that, that they all know, people can visualise very easily a student reading his books, they seem to think that we shouldn't do anything else. Well, I don't see why, why we shouldn't do the things that someone else who's working with his hands or at a machine or someone else working with books in a factory. Why, why can't we be entitled to try and have a positive role in society as students in the same way that engineers collectively can have a positive role in society? People tend, tend, tend to disregard us, but they don't seem to realise anyway, public reading about students in the paper, realising that these are students. They're people who live down their road, who grew up in the house next door. In fact, they're flesh and blood, you know, went to school with them and so on, so we are them, but they don't recognise us. <laughs>